<laughs> well, good morning. I'm glad you survived the blizzard of 24. Now that's over. Lord willing. <laughs> So good morning, and um, if you're reading through the Bible with us, um, th these past few weeks you've been in Book of Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus getting into the, there. Um, let me ask a question. Anybody get bogged down in the details? <laughs> good. There's a low rumble of yes. You know, th that happens, and I just encourage you, you, gotta, you push through that. Sometimes, I'll be honest, as, even as your pastor, we more scan than read. Every detail in Scripture is important. They're there for a reason. But when I see a list of uh, offerings, say, for the tribes, and there's this offering that's exactly the same as the next 12, <laughs> I kind of scan a little bit. I tend to come to a genealogy. Sometimes I go back to my Evelyn Woods speed reading class. Um, <laughs> Somebody remembered that name. Is that still a thing? Yeah, I never took it, but I, I just remember the ads. Anyhow, this morning I want to look at something that uh, Moses wrote. He is one of the central figures um, in, in, in the Old Testament, especially in the portion we've been reading lately. Um, so we're going to look at his, a little bit of his life. His life begins rather tenuously as he's rescued from the Nile River and from the, he's spared from Pharaoh's evil edict. Pharaoh was intimidated by the Hebrew people. As you recall, they, they come down to the land of Egypt by, because of Joseph, Joseph and that whole story about the Israelites coming down to be spared from the famine. And then a lot of time passes and there's pharaohs and leaders who forget who Joseph was and who these people are and they become enslaved by the Egyptians. And they are now growing very numerous and Pharaoh is threatened by their existence. So he makes an unthinkable, unconscionable law to have all the newborn males killed. And I just say that to say that you've got to love the heroic Hebrew midwives who flat out lie to Pharaoh in order to spare the babies. These were women who feared God more than the king and the king comes and questions them, says, why are you not, why are these babies living? And they say, well, the Hebrew women are too strong. We don't get to them in time. And so they're not like the Egyptian women. And that's the ruse that they employ. And the king, the Pharaoh believes them. And um, Moses and the rest, uh, many babies are spared. And I also, uh, only say that because that's where his life starts and um, but also because of a group of nurses who will not kill children at the risk of their own lives. That is a poignant reminder. There's so many analogies we can, we can make to that, but God protects these precious women, and in this way, he protects Moses as well. And we, as Christians, we, we ought to be continuing to stand up for the least among us, and especially the unborn, and we continue to champion that cause as the people of God. And so Moses grows up in Pharaoh's house, and um, as he grows older, he gets involved in a skirmish with an Egyptian who's mistreating a Hebrew slave, and he ends up killing this Egyptian, and consequently ends up running for his life. And he's, he's now forced to, to run, and he spends 40 years tending sheep out in the wilderness. And in the course of time, he encounters God in the burning bush that incident, and God commissions him to go back to Egypt and to challenge Pharaoh because God had heard the cries of his people. I love that phrase, God hears the cries of his people. He said, I've heard them. And you know, when you look at this timeline here, it's, it's rather a long time before God responds, and that's a good reminder for you and I that he hears our cry, but his timing is often very different than ours. I love Psalm 38, I think it's verse 9, that says, he hears every sigh <laughs> that we utter. I love that because it's, uh, you, know, you ever get those days where you're just, ah, <laughs> he hears every one of them. And not only that, he's heard the cries of his people and he's responding to them by sending Moses. 
And so he calls Moses, and Moses balks at that call, and finally he begins his journey back, and on the way back we have that confusing little interlude where God wants to kill him. And as you were reading through that, many people were asking that question, what's that all about? And uh, it's one of those things we really don't know. It's possibly have to do with uh, the covenant and with um, the Abrahamic covenant through which Moses would have been um, required to circumcise himself and his child. And so we see in that little interlude that his wife does, takes care of that. And, but re regardless, God relents. But again, there's a lot more questions around that than, than answers. And that's not the point of what we're talking about today. So Moses goes down to Egypt and he has this titanic confrontation with Pharaoh he comes and he says, you need to let my people go so they can wor worship me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh looks at him like, who the heck are you? <laughs> like, and he hardens his heart. He makes the people work harder. They're to make bricks without straw and increasing their workload. And then the 10 plagues come on that land, one after another, and the hardening of Pharaoh's heart where he lets the people, he relents, and then he hardens his heart again, and then God hardens his heart, and then back and forth. And Finally, he lets the Hebrews go after the death of the firstborn. And then as they're going and out in the wilderness, Pharaoh re reconsiders once again, and his heart is hardened for one fatal last time, and he pursues the Hebrews, and they are annihilated in the Red Sea, the Egyptian army is. And so, you know, that's a reminder too. Again, I'm not preaching about those things this morning, but, you know, God is patient with us. We can harden our hearts toward him. Many of us have relatives and friends we're praying for, and we see their hearts hardened and hardened, and God is very patient. And this reminds us of God's patience with that kind of a hard heart. But there comes a time when he says, no more. And so Pharaoh and his army are wiped out in that incident in the Red Sea, because God will not be mocked forever. And so after that, Moses is given the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, instructions for the tabernacle and the priests and their worship, their instructions on sacrifice, a lot of details. Reading through that, I don't know if, if you've been reading through just the detail after detail about proper worship and order, and it seems aimed at a respect for God and the holiness of God and the importance in detail and preparation. You look at all the ornaments in the temple, all the way the temple was supposed to be erected and taken care of. And it, as I was reading through that, it just made me wonder, you know, in my own life, ha have we lost too much of that? I'm not preaching to you necessarily. I was preaching to myself as I was looking through that. Or have we lost some of that? It made me think of all this preparation, all the people were getting ready to worship, and, and I thought of myself strolling into church and scrolling through my iPhone and seeing if I have a text, checking what the weather is, and how sometimes I get, I think, far too flippant as we come to worship the Lord. And I don't have an answer for you this morning, but I'm reflecting on that personally and just kind of throwing up on you this morning. But just the question, do I prepare my heart enough? Am I, and my mind, do I get away from the million things that, that tend to distract us from God? And especially in light of looking at the Old Testament, all the preparations that had to be made to worship God and his holiness and his mystery and all the, all the things that had to be in order and how God wants order in our lives as well. So I just leave that out there for you to think along about with me. This morning, I want to look at Psalm 90, because this is a psalm that's penned by Moses. It is a psalm of praise and a ref reflection on life. He is an older man by now. If you remember, as the story is going to go on, is Moses is not allowed to enter the promised land because of his own disobedience to the Lord. And so he, he's writing this toward the end of his life. He talks about the fleeting nature of life. He talks about the desire to have our days count and our lives matter. He talks about dealing with our own sin, and it's really a realistic and healthy look at life. And I'd just like to read through Psalm 
90, and then we'll pray together and, and take a look at it. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, return to dust, O sons of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new by evening. It is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80. If we have the strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow. For they quickly pass, and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Father, we come to you today, Lord, and I thank you for Moses. This, as the chapter heading says, who was a man of God. I thank you for his reflection on life and for the reminders it holds for us. And I just pray that you would be our teacher this morning, Lord. We all come here with our own stuff, Lord, and the things mulling over in our own minds, the, the tasks of the week that lie ahead, the, the joys and the sorrows of the week that are behind us. And Lord, I pray that you would um, do what only you can do. You'd speak to each one of our hearts today. Just remind us of your faithfulness and your goodness. And speak, Lord. And thank you for Moses and for your inspiring him to write this portion of Scripture for us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So I'm not going to go necessarily through every verse here, but I do want to look at some themes, and I will scroll through the psalm, and then we'll uh, just draw some conclusions. But for, right in verse 1, he says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. You are our dwelling place. I love that phrase. You are home. <laughs> you, you're an oasis for us. You are the source of every, of hope for every generation. And I stop right there and I say, for us, is he, is he my home? Is, is he your home? Is that the place you go for refuge and safety? And I, I just encourage you because I know in my own life that walking with my Father in heaven is the only safe place to be. It just is. There's no other place. Every generation, he's saying, finds its rest in you. You, Yahweh, are our dwelling place. And it, we don't see that phrase too often. That's Moses' phrase. He uses that. You're our dwelling place. David will say, you're my, you're, you're my great shepherd. You're the light of the world. He'll say, you are the, um, the rock on which I stand. You're my strength and my shield. The sons of Korah will say, God is our refuge, an ever-present help in trouble. So there's different words for this same idea that God is our dwelling place. What's your word? I encourage you to think about that. This. What, what, when you think of when you find your rest in God, you find your hope in God, David says he's my hiding place. I love that. There's a whole lot of analogies in Scripture for who our God is. And Moses is saying, you're our dwelling place. You're the place 
where we go and we are home. You're an oasis, you're a rock. The New Testament will say in you we live and move and have our being. I love that. That's the foundation for Moses in his walk with God and his walk with the people. He says, before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He's saying you're, you are the God who was at the beginning. The biblical writers understood that God is eternal. The biblical writers understood that God is the creator of all things. You brought forth the earth and the world. You are our dwelling place. Psalm 90, interestingly, follows a Psalm 89. Isn't that interesting? That's a, get that. That's a deep thought for today. But as they, as they ordered the Psalter, Psalm 89, it, and so Psalm 90, are, are, it's not just haphazard, because Psalm 89 is a long psalm, and, and it largely talks about the exile, the fall of the Davidic monarchy, the people of God had known the kingship, Saul and David and Solomon, especially David, and David's kingdom was to be a lasting kingdom. And Psalm 89 laments the loss of this kingdom, the kingship. In a sense, they're saying in Psalm 89, where do we turn? And so Moses re- is, reminding, uh, 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 Moses is reminding us and them and generations yet future, that we find our hope in God alone. I probably don't have to tell you that this is an election year. At the end of this year, God will have a person as president of the United States. Who it is, I don't know. But I can tell you this, our trust is never to be in that person. Never ultimately. And that's what he's reminding Israel. You've trusted in the Davidic kingdom. You loved it when David was king. It was so good and so powerful. But your home, your trust is in me. Your trust and my trust is in God alone. And he's reminding them that he is eternal. This is a man who spoke with God from the cleft of the rock and saw God pass by and He understands that he is the creator and he's the God of all things and he is our resting place. We go to verses three to six and he says this, you turn men back to dust saying, return to dust, O sons of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning though in the morning it springs up new by evening. It is dry and withered. He reminds us of the absolute authority of God over our lives, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We're likened to the new grass that springs up in the morning. By evening, it's dry and withered. We're told that a thousand years in his sight are like a a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. A watch was a four-hour time period that a soldier would serve. You sweep us away in the sleep of death. Moses had seen his share of loved ones who had gone. All that generation that died in the wilderness, the plague on the firstborn, the Red Sea, destruction of the, of the people. You and I have seen our share. I can go around this room, moms and dads who have gone on to be with the Lord, husbands and wives and kids too young, how quickly we are swept away. I got two calls this weekend, one from Phil McGee, who lost his son. I mention that because many of you, or some of you may know Phil McGee and be praying for him and his family. I got a call this morning from, just from um, Sharon Winter. She just told me that Bruce had just passed away, and Bruce and Sharon used to sit in the back over there. Um, But it's just a reminder how quickly things turn in our lives, how fleeting our lives are. And Moses was was not sidestepping that. I love that. He says 70 or 80 years if we have the strength. And and I know 
often it's much longer than that. There's people who are watching online or are 90, and we, have, we are blessed with a bunch of 90-year-olds in our congregation. But he's saying that understand that God has authority over us. And let me read on verses 7 to 11. He says this, We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. If their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger, for your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. He talks about his righteous anger and his divine rebuke. He talks about the fact that he set our iniquities before him. Our sin, even our secret sins that we think nobody knows about. Moses reminds us that that's a joke. You've set our secret sins in the light, the spotlight of your presence. And our iniquities are always before you. Moses, this man of God, clearly knew about his own stuff and his own missteps and his own idolatry and his own lack of faith at times. And a God who knows all about it. And I mention this because while this passage doesn't necessarily talk about repentance, I just want to talk about that for a few moments because Moses is hinting at, at the inner turmoil of trying to hide our sins from God. We think they're secret sins, but he's saying, no, they're exposed by God in the light of his presence. Nothing's hidden from him. Sometimes we have these secret sins that we think no one knows about it or that we're even somehow fooling ourselves to thinking that we're keeping it from God. But a freeing part of the Christian life is confession and repentance. It really is. It's part of our makeup. <laughs> you don't ever get to this point in the Christian life where, hey, I'm good. I don't need to repent anymore. I don't need... <laughs> no, because, Lord, that thought I had, that errant word I said to that person, that thing I did, whatever it was, and and no matter how long we walk with the Lord, and Moses is called a man of God, he's saying, you understand my secret sins. They're in the light of your presence. And so when we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9 tells us when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that. I listen to Steve Brown once in a while, and he's a, he's a guy who says, you know, when we're, our sin if we don't confess it. It's like a demon in our lives continuing to accuse us. And you read Psalm 51, you read Psalm 32, and you talk, David talks about the inner turmoil. And he, he says when we finally confess to the Lord our sin, it's like kissing that demon on the lips, saying, you don't own me. God knows all about it, and you're not going to torment me with that sin anymore. And for the Christian, that's a freeing thing. And so we talk about practicing a regular repentance in our lives. I always say the Roman Catholics had a really good thing, go to the confession booth, do it every day, do it every day. The difference is we don't believe you need a confession booth. You go to the Lord every day. That's where we go. You don't need me to, to hear your sin. You need to express it to the Lord. But it's a very good practice continue to repent before him. And then again, he says the length of our days is 70 or 80, or, and as we go on, it's 90, and it's not about a number of years. It's about, he's saying, there's a period that's destined for all of us. Verse 11 is the culmination of this section. He says, your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. When you use that term, the fear of God, it's kind of a holistic response to follow God. The fear of the Lord is a good thing. If my mind goes to the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge and instruction. The fear of the Lord is a healthy thing to know that we can fear him and not be afraid of him. A fear of the Lord helps us to walk in his ways and... and um, he says that your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. And Proverbs goes on to say, fools despise that kind of wisdom and instruction. 
He's reminding us life is short. It's relatively limited. It's tough at times, but our God is good. And so we're to keep these short, account, short accounts with him. We're to walk in the fear of the Lord, which is a good thing. That's not a trembling. That's a saying, Lord, you are God. You love me, and you have a way for me to walk. Help me to walk in it. And then he has this prayer in verses 12 to 17. He says this, teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord. And by the way, this is, most commentators see this as a prayer. He says this, relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. It's almost as if Moses is saying, in light of all this, here's the prayer. The prayer starts this, Lord, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Would you teach us, Lord, that our days are numbered? 70, 80. Many of us have no kid, children much younger than that, people much older than that. Would you help us to understand that there's a limit to this life? James tells us our life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and then is gone. David says in Psalm 39 or 40, our life is a hand breath. A hand width was a, was a measurement. You use that thing to measure certain things. We still use it to measure horses. I don't think we use it for anything else, right? So, anybody know of anything? I don't. But he's saying it's brief. The hand width was short. The vapor only lasted for a little while, as James says. And so the heart of wisdom knows, Lord, I don't live on this earth forever. I don't live in this body forever. Many of us are saying, thank God for that. You know that we're frail, Lord. Have compassion on us. You know about our foolish ways. You know how we slip back into bad patterns. And then he says, relent, O Lord. Have compassion on your servants. I love this part of the prayer. Moses needed this in his own life. Moses prayed this in his own life. You know, I mentioned that I, that little vignette that took place in his life was on his journey to Egypt. Remember, God was about to kill him, and we're not sure what takes place. Was his wife praying for him? I know we know she circumcised his son with some, but God decided not to. He relented. Moses, when the people come down, when he comes down from the mountain, and they built the golden calf. He says he prays on their behalf. Relent, O Lord! Don't let your anger burn against your people. And later on, we're told that the Lord relented. It's a difficult concept to grab hold onto that God could or would relent from his course of action. But there's a lesson here, I think. Moses, the man of God, believed that prayer made a difference. And we do too. We believe in a God who doesn't change. I was just reading from a Dr. Grudem's book about, um, uh, on theology, and he says this, about a God who doesn't change. God is infinitely worthy of trust because he is absolutely and eternally unchanging in his being, perfections, purposes, and promises. That's who we believe God is. He's unchanging. But in some marvelous way that I don't understand, in some mysterious way, he tells us that he uses the prayers of his people. And that has to do when we talk about his sovereign will and his permissive will, and we're not going to get into all of that today because it's a deep and rather intricate subject when we talk about prayer. But Moses knew, and I hope you know, that prayer makes a difference. And so he's telling us here that we're to pray. And we're to pray for, I don't know how you pray for your family or your country, and Lord, just... 
It's okay to pray, Lord, would you relent? Would you give us more time? Would you be gracious? Those prayers are all within his sovereign will of a God who is perfectly um, unique and unchanging. But prayer is at the core. It's mysterious, but it's good, and it's to be part of the makeup of God's people. And ultimately, when we pray, we're trusting in him to do what's best. And so he goes on in verse 14, and I'm just going to kind of go through these quick. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. Oh, don't we need that every day? (laughs) Your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. They were wandering in the desert for 40 years and difficult times and stuff going on. As many years as we have seen trouble. Isn't that our prayer too, Lord? Give us a season of joy. And we've gone through a rough season and so many of you have gone through those seasons. You know them well. And that's Moses' prayer. Give us joy for those times. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. I love that. May this love for you, Lord, be passed on. Let our children and our grandchildren see it. May they know of your deeds, and may they know of how good of a God we serve. And then in verse 17, he says, So, Lord, um, may the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. And who doesn't want that? (laughs) And then he says, Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Come back to that in a moment. I just want to bring this to a close by looking at three things. I think this psalm talks about home, it talks about perspective, and it talks about significance. Home, we've talked about at at length here, but we are not to forget where our dwelling place is. When we forget where our dwelling place is, we lose our moorings. (laughs) We get off the foundation. We get so easily led astray. Like Israel in Psalm 89 was reeling because there's no king. I mentioned our election year. There'll be all kinds of posturing this year, all kinds of promises, all kinds of lies, by the way, from both sides. And we scratch our heads and we, I will tell you at the end of the year, it's going to be God's man or God's woman in that oval office, the one he decrees, because that's, we trust in a sovereign God. And I will reiterate again, we are never to put our trust in a human leader. We are to pray for our leaders. We are to respect our leaders. He tells us to honor them and keep them in prayer. But the reminder is, and Moses is saying, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. It's not a king. It's not a leader, even though Moses was a leader of the people. It's you. You're our dwelling place. You're the safe place. You're our refuge. And boy, do we need that reminder over and over again. And you know, if you're listening this morning, if you're watching online and and you don't yet know him, I want to tell you something. Your hearts will be restless, as Augustine says, until they find their rest in him. Until you find your rest in the king of the universe. You're going to be looking everywhere else. And if you don't know the Lord, I can guarantee you have some family or friends who are praying that your heart will be restless until it finds its rest in Christ and in the God of the universe. He is our home. Lord, you are our dwelling place. You're the rock of protection and safety. You're our our oasis. Pick, Pick your own word. You're that place I can go to and I know I am safe and in the arms of my everlasting, uh, in the arms of my Father, who's the arms of the everlasting one. Secondly, this psalm is about perspective, especially verse 12. Teach us to number our days. Lord, help us to know that our days are number. And during our days, Lord, would we be wise enough to know that we're to be confessing our sin and not trying to hide it from you, 
walking carefully with our God, help us to know that this is a, there's a finite number to our days. This body will wear out. What we know, that home you live in will be gone and we'll be forever in our home with our Father in heaven. Help us not to forget that, Lord. And then thirdly is about significance. Who doesn't want their life to count? Who doesn't want the work of our hands to matter? We all do. So Moses' prayer at the end of this, he says this, may the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. We all want what we do to matter. And so Moses is saying, would you establish the work of our hands for us? We can't do it. <laughs> we can strive to, think, to make, try to do our best and all this other stuff, but his prayer is, Lord, I'm doing my best here. Would you establish the work of my hands? Would you make it matter? Would you give it significance? That's the prayer of the man of God. And Lord, by your grace, let your favor rest upon us. Let's pray together. Lord, I just thank you for, um, I thank you for the church here, Lord. We're a bunch of people who are seeking to, to know you, to live our lives like Jesus, to make a difference. And Lord, I pray that for our church, that you would establish the work of our church for us. Don't let it be about anything clever we can do or anything we can conjure up. Lord, you establish the work, this work, for your glory. I pray that for each person in, their, in our individual lives, Lord. We want our lives to matter. We want it, your grace and love to live on in our kids and in our grandkids. And so, Lord, unless you establish the work of our hands for us, that's not going to happen. So, Lord... Give us the grace as your people to rest in you, to know that you are our dwelling place. You are that rock of refuge. You are our hiding place. You're our deliverer. And Lord, in this culture that we live in, in this election year that we're all going to walk through, help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith that you would establish the, your work through us. And Lord, as we close, may the favor of the Lord rest upon your people. For we ask it in your precious name. Amen.